والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين إن شاء الله تعالى continue with the with the subject of خشوع in the صلاة learning how to develop خشوع consciousness of Allah سبحانه وتعالى in the prayer طال حسن البصري رحمه الله تعالى يوشك أن تدخل المسجد الجامع فلا ترى فيه خاشئا وقال أحد السلف كأنه يحدث عن زمان حسن البصري رحمه الله تعالى who was one of the تابعون the generation right after the Sahaba he said perhaps there's going to come a time where you enter into the masjid and you will not find one person who has kushur in their prayer who has consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their prayer. قال إمام أحمد رحمه الله تعالى يأتي على الناس زمان يصلون وهم لا يصلون إمام أحمد رحمه الله تعالى said that there is going to come a time where people are going to establish the prayer but they will not be praying. يصلون ولا يصلون They are going to establish the salat but they will not actually be praying. They will not actually be praying. And then you look at some of the things that people do right after they pray. You find people that will establish the salat and then turn right around and walk out of the masjid door and open up a, and smoke a cigarette right in front of the masjid. How could you have khushur? You'll find Muslims, young Muslims, males and females who will come to the masjid with their boyfriends and girlfriends, pray and then leave together, pull up in the car together, come to Jumwa together, boyfriend and girlfriend, courting, pull up to the masjid together, go listen to a Jumwa khutbah, pray the salah, and then leave in the same car together. People pray, yusalluna wa hum la yusalloon. We will come to a time where people will establish the salat, but they will not be praying. The salat will have no bearing on them, simply because there is one component of the salat that is missing, and that is known as khushur. Some of the sahaba, عنهم, they used to punish themselves for something less than this. Whenever they found that they were not concentrating in their prayer, you will find that they would punish themselves to make themselves conform to this particular act of worship the way that they are supposed to. قَدْ رُوَى عَنْ طَلْحَ عَلَىٰ أَنْصَارِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالُهُ قَدْ رُوِيَ عَنْ طَلْحَ عَلَىٰ أَنْصَارِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالُهُ كَانَ يُصَلِّي ذَاتِ يَوْمٍ وَرَأَى طَيْرًا يَخْرُجُ مِنْ بَيْنِ الشَّجَرِ فَتَعَلَّقَتْ عَيْنَاهُ بِالطَّائِرِ حَتَّى نَسِيَ كَمْ صَلَّ ويقول يا رسول الله إني انشغلت بالطائق في البستان حتى نسيت كم صليت فإني أجعل هذا البستان صدقة في سبيل الله فضعه يا رسول الله حيث شئت لعل الله سبحانه وتعالى يغفر لي لا إله إلا الله. One of the Sahaba رضي الله تعالى عنه by the name of طلحة الأنصاري. He said one day I was praying in my garden. I was playing, praying in my garden one day and as I was making salat my eyes became attached to a bird that was flying in and out of trees. Just a bird flying in and out of trees and you know at, in that split second my eye locked on the bird and what the bird was doing and I forgot how many rakahs I prayed. In that split instance, my eyes became attached to the bird and what the bird was doing, and I forgot how many rakahs I was praying, or how many I have already prayed. He said, so I felt bad, so after I finished the salah, I went to the Prophet ﷺ, while I was crying. Here's a man crying because he felt like there was a particular portion of his prayer where he was not conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We may go the whole salah thinking about what we're going to do after the prayer and never feel bad afterwards. Never feel bad that, subhanAllah, I didn't pray that prayer in the right way, I'm going to do that over. We just feel like, 
I've done what is upon me, khalas. You know, it's up to Allah to decide whether he's going to accept that or not. Subhanallah His eye became attached to a bird going in and out of the tree. And he said, I forgot how many rakahs I prayed. So I went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I'm crying to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that I was making salat in my garden. He said, and I, in a split second, my eye became attached to this bird going in and out of the tree. And I forgot how many rakahs I prayed. He said, فَجَعَلْتُ هَذَا الْبُسْتَانْ لَكَ صَدَقَةٍ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ ضَعْهَا حَيْثُ شِئْتْ He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm going to give you my garden as a sadaqah to punish myself because it was the cause of my forgetting about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to give you my garden sadaqah, take my garden and do with it whatever you will. Punishing himself because that was the cause of him interfering with his Worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man taraka shay'in lillah aw wadahullahu khayru minha That whoever leaves something for the pleasure of Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, place it with, will replace it with what is better. Hoping that if I give you this garden, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give me in return khushur in my salah. Giving something away for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in hopes that Allah will give you what is better than it. Sometimes we're looking for reciprocity. We're looking for if I give up this, then Allah is going to give me that. Meaning the same thing equal in return. How about you give up that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you an increase in iman. How about you give up that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you stronger faith give you an increase in faith. We're always looking for things that are tangible. If I give this job up, Allah is going to bless me with another job. Now, maybe Allah doesn't bless you with another job. Maybe Allah blesses you with concrete faith, unshakable faith. And that is priceless. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Inna Allah yu'ti al-abd min, min, min hadha dunya man yuhib wa man la yuhib. The Prophet وسلم, said that Allah will give this dunya to anybody from amongst his servants, those whom he loves and those whom he doesn't love, but he only gives true faith to those whom he loves. He only gives iman to those whom he loves. SubhanAllah. But we're always looking for something that's tangible. We're always looking if I give this up, then maybe Allah is going to give me better than it. Yeah, maybe your better comes in the form of something that is intangible, something that is priceless, something that you can't put a price tag on, like faith, like iman, like trust, like tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Lo tawakkaltum Allahi haqqa tawakkulihi la yarzukukum kama yarzukat tayyar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that if you were to trust in Allah like you are supposed to trust in Him, then he will provide for you like he provides for the birds. They leave out of their nest in the morning with their stomachs empty and they always return home with a full stomach. Always return home with a full stomach. Trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sabr, patience. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا أُعْتِيَ عَبْدٌ عَطَاءً أَوْ سَعْ وَخَيْرٌ مِنَ الصَّبَرِ That the servant has never been given a gift that is more vast, more inclusive, and more better than more better than the, the gift of patience. These are priceless gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you in return for the things that you give up for his pleasure. Stop looking for things that are tangible. Stop looking for the tangible return on the things that you give up for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because technically Allah doesn't have to reward you with anything. It's an incentive. You are supposed to give up the haram. You are supposed to give up something that busies you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah doesn't technically owe you anything. It is out of His rahmah, out of His mercy, and out of an incentive to encourage you to do the right thing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't owe you anything. You are supposed to give up the haram. You are supposed to give up anything that busies you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as an incentive, Allah says that whoever gives up something for the pleasure of Allah, then Allah will replace it. The Prophet said that whoever gives up something for the pleasure of Allah, then Allah will replace it with what is better. So you'll find the Sahaba that they loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his remembrance more than anything else. 
and as he was praying in his garden and things in his garden began to influence him and to deter him from the remembrance of Allah, he gave it up, gave it to the Prophet وسلم, take it and do whatever, whatever you want with it. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive me for that small moment in my prayer where I was ghafil, where I wasn't even thinking about him. SubhanAllah If only we had a portion of their concern for their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If only we had a portion of their concern for their worship and the perfection of their worship, they would punish themselves simply because they wanted to do better. As one of the salaf, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Kuntu akhtab al nas. He said that I used to backbite people. And I wanted to give up this bad habit of backbiting people. He said, Fanadaratu and kullam akhtab tu ahadan asumu yawman. He said that I made a pact with myself. I made an oath to myself that every time I backbit someone, then I would fast a day. I would fast a day to punish myself. If you're going to backbite, then the next day you are going to fast. He said, Fakuntu akhtab. He said, so I used to fast and backbite, fast and backbite, fast and backbite until I got tired. I started to take a toll on my body and I still wasn't feeling the effect. I still was enough for me to give up backbiting. He said, He said, He said, he says, so this wasn't working for me. So I made another oath to myself that every time I backbit someone, I would give some of my money away, sadaqah, give it away something that I love in hopes and return that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that my body would conform to giving up backbiting. He said, so I would backbite someone and give sadaqah. He said, and because of my love for my money, I ended up giving up backbiting. He said, and because of my love for money, I ended up eventually giving up backbiting. Because I'm not going to give away the things that I love. I'm going to keep my money and stop backbiting. The point that I'm making is that these are things that the scholars or the salaf or the sahaba used to do in the past to help them develop khushur in the salah. And I'll just leave everyone with a few ways in which you can develop khushua in your prayer being solution oriented number one to remember death dhikr al mawt while you're in your prayer as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to say uthkur al mawt fi salatik fa inna ar rajul idha dhakara al mawt fi salatihi la hariyun an yakhsha Allah aw yuhassin salatahu wa salat ar rajul la yadhunnu annahu yusalli ghayraha the Prophet Sallallahu said, remember death much in your prayer. While you are establishing Salah, remember death much in your prayer. For indeed, the man who remembers death in his Salah, يحسن صلاته, then it is more likely, more probable that he will perfect his prayer. He will perfect his prayer and he will pray like a man who thinks that he does not have another prayer to pray. If you believe that this is the last salat that you are going to pray, then you are going to perfect that salat unlike you would do with any other prayer. Number two, another ila mawdi sujood an Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha qalat anna rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam idha salla ta'ta'a ra'sahu wa rama bibasrihi nahwa al-ard wa amma idha jalasa lit-tashahud fa innahu yanzuru ila isba'ihi Aisha she said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he would stand for the prayer he would lower his head down like this and he would stare at the place where his head was going to touch the ground not looking here or looking there in the prayer you shouldn't be looking straight ahead or looking at this one or looking at that one you should be looking down at the ground where your forehead is going to touch the ground so that your eyes are fixated on the place where you are going to prostrate. She said, except when he was doing the tashahud, when he was sitting for the tashahud, and he would stare at his finger as he pointed, or in another narration, as he moved his finger in the prayer. Number three, 
الاجتهاد بالدعاء في مواضعه في الصلاة خصوصا في السجود قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أقرب ما يكون العبد من ربه وهو ساجد فأكثر الدعاء في السجود رواه مسلم Number three from the things that will help you develop khushu in the prayer is to make an abundance of dua in the places of the prayer where you are supposed to make dua in the places of the prayer where you are supposed to make dua and this is especially, especially applies to sujood as the Prophet وسلم, said the closest place that the servant is to his Lord is when he is in sujood فَأَكْثِرُوا الدُّعَى فِي السُّجُودِ So make an abundance of dua while you are in sujood Stop pecking like a bird in sujood Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Stop pecking like a bird in sujood Stay in sujood for a moment That is the closest place that you are going to get on earth to your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala The closest place that you can get to Allah is when you put your forehead on the ground so why wouldn't we want to take time in that position to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Number four, from the things that will help you develop khushu' in the salat, tadabbur al-ayat al maqru'ah is to ponder and reflect on the verses that are being recited. If the imam is reciting ayats from Surah to Yusuf, then you ponder and reflect on what you know of the stories in Surah to Yusuf. If the imam is reciting from verses from Surah to Ibrahim, or the, the story of Ibrahim, ponder and reflect. And mind you, there are those of us who may not know the Quran in Arabic. That would be an incentive for you to go and learn Arabic. Stop uh, procrastinating. Stop saying to yourself, I will never get this language. I, Shadi Muhammad, am someone who maybe 15 years ago, I did not know a lick of Arabic. I did not understand anything when I stood in the Salat behind the Imam Ramadan after Ramadan after Ramadan Taraweeh ba'd the Taraweeh ba'd the Taraweeh would go by and I never understood what the Imam was reciting in Taraweeh and today I lead the Salat al-Taraweeh and I understand walillahi alham everything that comes out of my mouth or the Imam's mouth as he's reciting I am living proof that there can come a time in your life where you understand everything that is being recited by the Imam in some instances more than the own the Imam himself understands. I'm living proof that that can happen. The first time someone ever gave me uh, volumes of Sahih al-Bukhari, they gave me five, six volumes of Sahih al-Bukhari in all Arabic. I said, what am I going to do with Sahih al-Bukhari in all Arabic? I don't know how to read Arabic. He said, maybe one day there will come a day where you do know how to read Arabic and you can benefit from those books. Walillahi alhamd, I can read Sahih al-Bukhari in Arabic. Walillahi alhamd. I'm saying to you, stop saying to yourself, I'm not going to learn Arabic language because I'm too old. I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to understand. One of the scholars of the past, he thought that seeking knowledge was very difficult for him. And so he gave up seeking knowledge and he began to pack his things and leave out of the city and go home. On his way out of the city, he stopped for a second to rest. And the scholars of the past, they used to ponder and reflect on creation. Right? The modern technology has impeded our ability to ponder and reflect on the things that are around us. So he stopped for a second and he looked at a boulder. He looked at a rock. And water droplets kept falling on it. You asakhra that the water droplets begin to have an impact on the rock. The rock, this big boulder, and through the process of erosion, water droplets constantly hitting it, it created a dent in the top of the rock. And he said to himself that my heart is not as hard as that boulder, and knowledge. Uh, uh, and and that, that water is not as soft as knowledge And if water can do that to that rock over a period of time Then what do you think knowledge can do to my heart over a period of time And he went back and he sought knowledge And he became from the imams of this ummah And I'm talking about Imam al-Dhahabi rahimahullah ta'ala Who wrote one of the largest books on seerah that we have In the Arabic language called seerah a'lam al-nubala and as a scholar said, مَنْ رَامَ الْعِلْمُ جُمْلَةً ذَهَبَ عَنْهُ جُمْلَةً فَإِنَّمَا يُطْلَبُ الْعِلْمُ عَلَى الْمَرْغِ 